Welcome back. Meet the president. Tonight, presidential candidate Cyrus Jirongo. Let's get to some of your um, feedback now on social media. Remember the hashtag to use is meet the president at KTN News at Yvonne Okwara. Um, let me read this tweet right now, which is, uh, Jirongo is a jubilee project and he can't deny it. The math is to plant Jirongo and Ababu to divide the Luya votes. Does he have any vo vote to tilt the votes? We'll be putting that to him. Um, uh, huh. Okay, I'm trying to, here's one. Jirongo is a, okay. Uh, okay, your <laughs> tweets are coming in uh, quite fast. Um, Jirongo, now if you mean what you're saying, please join NASA in court tomorrow. They're going to court to, um, you know, challenge this process of the ballot tender uh, printing um, uh, that has been we've discussed just before the break. Is this something you're prepared to do? Join them in court? I think uh, when I talk about clarity of thought, you can have great leaders, people who believe in great things. But when you don't have clarity of where you want to go, uh, sometimes it takes negotiation to force clarity. If I had to negotiate tomorrow after an election or a rerun, I'll prove to all Kenyans that uh, I clearly know what I want for this country and I know what I'm looking for for this country. And I can assure you one thing. I'd rather stay at home than negotiate with the Jubilee. And those that dream that I have an association with the Jubilee, I've clearly uh, uh, told you. The last time I had a chat with uh, Uhuru is uh, during Soita's funeral. And uh, if I was accused of being a Raila or a Dida project or a Nyaga project, it might make uh, somebody can argue about it. But I really do not understand why somebody uh, who knows me, if you know me at all, would ever believe Jirongo can be anybody's this project. All right, so that tweet was from Stephen Oma Mac Anyal. Yeah. People who know you, do you think people know you enough? When we uh, put out this question uh, a couple of hours ago on whether they would vote for you, a number of people said they don't know you. A number of people said they don't even know who your running mate is. Um, you started this race rather late in the day, um, perhaps banking on the previous history of you know, your political uh, career, but there's a sense in which there's a group of Kenyans that say... It's too late. It's too late, they don't know I you, because do you keep referring to people who know me, but how many people really okay, know fine. you, Mr. Uh, maybe uh, you might be right to some extent, but let me tell you, some time back, we used only to have 21 days to go and campaign. And uh, Kenyans would make a decision. We have a long time, of a four, about 46 days to election. If I went out there and explained what I believe in, what I think I can offer this country, to me, I believe Kenyans are intelligent enough, and it is only a dead person who doesn't change his mind. Uh, he's fixed in a grave, and that's where he is. But if you went and explained exactly what you want and what you can do for your country, I believe we have adequate time to communicate to Kenyans and they'll be able to understand. And are you meeting them out there on the campaign trail? You've I been, will be going. You've been quite underground I've for some putting, time. I've been putting a network in place. Uh -huh. You need people on the ground. You need people who will do the relevant things for you on the ground. Okay. And I believe in doing things myself because there is a certain quality of people I'm looking for also. All right, there was also that tweet uh, that I read out to you, I think it was by the same Stephen Omar, who says, well, if you um, agree with uh, NASA in principle regarding the ballot printing uh, tender, would you be willing to join them in court? Like, how far are you willing to take the statement we that you said? We will go with them flat out, because uh -huh. I do believe we need a free and fair election. We need to give Kenyans an opportunity to elect a leader of their choice. Basically, I believe in it, and I'm available to fight it all the way to the end. Do you think in general that IABC is uh, competent, capable, and willing to conduct a free and fair um, election across all the six levels? Out of uh, the team, we have people there I believe in. But unfortunately, they seem not to be in control of what is happening because... You have no reason whatsoever when something has been pointed out 
that we have a reason to believe there's a problem with this particular company. Why must you persist and insist that that company is the one that must do the work? So maybe they're not totally in control. Maybe they're control? just... We Who's in control know. of the IBC if not we the commissioners? We actually don't know because if they're in control, why would they insist they're going to the same company? Given the history, given the, the, the previous complaints that have been made, that is not the only printing company uh, on the globe. Why are they insisting? It must be the They're company talking about that time constraints. For God's sake, when did people complain about or when did the issues arising out of this Dubai company come out? Long, long time ago. Why would you then not take action at that correct time? Wait, wait, and try and use time constraints to impose whatever you want on the Kenyan people. Let's focus a little bit on the economy um, at this point. Uh, the Jubilee administration had promised double-digit growth. Um, there have been some false starts, but then perhaps some would say, with the challenges that were taking place globally as well, what's your assessment of, of, of the economy, uh, its growth, and what would your presidency look like? What um, are you willing to put on the table in terms of even a manifesto, which many Kenyans are still not yeah, familiar no with uh, when it comes to your specific plans for the country, but just your assessment of the economy and where we are right now? Basically, there was a very good foundation laid by Kibaki. And normally, we have a social aspect of uh, uh, life, we do have the economy, and we have the political. And I think those pillars were laid down. And further, he went ahead and put up a constitution. He actually pushed very hard for us to have the new constitution. In that particular constitution, there's a bill of rights. And when people talk about a manifesto, there should be competition on how to meet that bill of rights. Free housing, free medical. I picked on free medical, because looking at what it costs an individual to get a cover, an insurance cover from NHIF, for instance, is just 500 shillings per, uh, per person per month. Assuming we are 50 million, which we are not, that is 300 billion annually. That takes care of the problem of doctors because the hospitals will be able to charge properly, right? We do not need the Kenya government or the county government being the one responsible for doctors. If every single Kenyan has been given a medical cover, it means the hospitals will be able to charge what they need to charge to repair whatever disease you have correctly, and therefore they have the ability to employ their doctors, they have the ability to employ their nurses. So you're talking about walking back the devolution of health? It sounds like it, because you're saying the county uh, governments don't no, need to the, be, the, the doctors the, don't need to be no, under the, the county governments. the Minister of uh, uh, Health is at world function. Yes. Being at world function, it, me it doesn't mean devolution ends at the county. We talked about referral hostels across the country in 47 uh, counties. That literally could be the hospital that is in charge of the rest of the hospitals in that particular county. A county, if How you How different is that from what we it's, have it's, now? No, 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 no. Literally, procurement is done in Nairobi, right? And there's no reason why procurement is being done at, in Nairobi other than corruption, other than somebody wants to control that money. Second, I'm saying, the easiest and the most disturbing situation in Kenya is Medicare. A lot of people are suffering, they can't afford drugs, we have a lot of problems with the doctors, yet using 300 billion, which is stolen at the Minister of Health annually or wasted, you would be able to provide a proper insurance cover for every single Kenyan and all hospitals will charge properly and therefore the issue of the national government or the county government running around looking for money to pay doctors doesn't arise. You only spend 300 uh, billion annually, and you've sorted out your health issue. That is one issue we can deal with. Secondly, all of you saw what was happening in Kilifi the other time. You do not believe a human being 
would have been taking the dirty water we saw Kenyans drinking. Surely, with all the rivers and the water we have in this country, having been independent for over 50 years, can't we come up with a basic provision of clean water to every single Kenyan? And how would you do that? How would you provide clean water to all Kenyans? <laughs> Providing clean water, we have enough water reservoirs in Kenya. All you need is a proper distribution system. Do we have enough water reservoirs? Is, uh, because Kenya is a in, water deficient uh, no, country. In Turkana alone, the lake that was discovered underground could supply the entire republic with water for 70 years. But somebody comes up and says, that water is not very good, and therefore we don't want to concentrate there. Because somebody wants to do pans and dams to do business. And that's why I said, very many people go into leadership with totally different objectives. We have countries that live in deserts, and they try and desalinate water to ensure their people have clean water with the amount of water so we have in this country. So all you're saying is uh, the aquifer and, and what was discovered in Turkana yes. is enough for Kenya. That so it, it, what it, about it. these other efforts um, that are in place? There's the Thwake Dram, uh, Dam, there's the Itare. A majority of that is... Although they are controversial, um, but what are your thoughts on a that? Majority do we of need that any of those? just creating projects to do business. That is what the leadership is all about in this country. And that's why I said the objective of leadership is not about competence. The objective of what they want to be remembered for might not be very clear to them. Because if you really wanted to provide services, I believe there are many opportunities to provide proper services to the Kenyan people. Okay. Yeah, you talk about uh, you know, the motives and the integrity of people. It would be interesting, Mr. Jirongo, to understand your source of wealth. What, what does Mr. Jirongo do uh, for a living? Where does he earn his money from? Mr. Jirongo, from the time he came to this town, he can account for every single shilling, beginning with a loan of 70,000, moving forward, coming into real estate, developing, acquiring a number of assets. And I want to challenge you. I have a number of properties in this uh, town and uh, across this country. And show me one property that is an allotment letter from a government. All the properties I have, have purchased. At the time I put up Hazina Estate in South Bay, 560 something housing units, uh, talking of three million shillings per house, uh, coming to close to 1.8 billion shillings. It was a crime to think of a billion shillings. Now, you I can A lot of those projects are controversial. To say the least. And one, land is purchased. Two, you build your houses. The controversy is your client who bought those houses. And let me tell you, the worst thing you can ever do, if you don't want to tow the line, political line, never engage in any business with the government. Deal with the public, sell your houses to the public, you'll be a happy man, you'll put your money in the pocket, nobody will crush you. But if you lived in Kenya, the years we have lived in this country. One of the tools opponents use is to ensure Yvonne is my political competitor, I must make sure Yvonne doesn't have a shilling in her pocket. And they'll try and mess up with anything you try to do as long as you ever engage the government to do any business. And I learned that too late. Because my first and only project that I ever did and I thought the government is going to be a good client because they were buying everything at a go, at that time, I wasn't even interested in politics. It's as in a state. The rest of my projects, I've sold it to the public. So you're saying you're a victim of, of government and... Uh, I'm not a alone. Person, a person How did Continental Bank close? How, I mean, history covers it. How did Matthew Pepper close? Uh, uh, I mean, it's historical. Everybody can look at it and everybody can see. Why would you believe Macharia of Royal Media was not a good businessman when he's running Royal Media the way he's running it today? And yet you took away Matthew Pepper from him and claimed he's not a good businessman. So history can bear me out. That is the way politics of that day were conducted. And yet you are a child of the politics of that day, working very closely and having a robust youth and business persons um, alliance that, you know, supported uh, life, the previous regime. In my entire life, I've had association with a regime closely for one year when I worked for Kano in 1992. From then, I have never, 
never been close to any regime. If you remember, at the time of Nusumukate, despite the fact that we worked and I cooperated with Raila, mm -hmm. I was the only person, when they did the Nusumukate thing, who was in the opposition. So for all these years, if he's to be in the government, as a kind supporter for one year, and as a minister for one year, I've never been in the government from then. Go back when I was in the government as a minister, and history will bear me out. Say one single day when there is a dot that you as a minister for regional development, A, B, C, D happened in your ministry. So how Not different are you? Um, we understand, of course, in politics, everybody started at the beginning, which was Kanu, but yet everybody was there, and then people started to break away, you know, along the way. So how, how different are you? What lessons have you learned from the past? Um, what guarantees can you give us that you are different from Uhuru Kenyatta, from Raila Odinga, from Joe Nyaga, um, who has served in, in previous administrations just like you have? So what's different about you now? I worked in the ministry for one year, right? I campaigned for Moi, and the duration of that campaign was one year. I've never had an opportunity where I'm totally in charge and I'm delivering services to Kenyans. And that's why I said my objective is totally different. And I'm looking for that opportunity for this craving of self-actualization, just honor. Mr. Jirongo, one year, six months, two days, an hour. <laughs> All I'm asking is, what is different about you? People will remember is... you vociferously defending, uh, you know, the previous regime in YK92. Is that How many years are those, Yvonne? Th that is not a problem. What I'm asking I then... I have been Secretary General of Kanu. Uh, not Raila a problem. Raila was Secretary General of Kanu. Uh -huh. So is that what makes you different been, simply because you were never, not Secretary General me, of those parties? I have never been uh, another Secretary of Kanu. William Ruto was Secretary General of Kanu. I have never been Chairman of Kanu. Uhuru Kenyatta was Chairman of Kanu. And so that makes you better I than those other candidates? I'm totally different. You remember, after 1997, we formed the UDM. We did. Although I went in Parliament on a ticket of Kanu, in the same 1992, many opposition leaders will tell you, we worked together. And that's why I'm saying, I need an opportunity, Kenyans, to understand exactly who they're dealing with. And that opportunity, I have told you what my self-actualization is all about. Honor for who? For you or for the Kenyans? You look for honor through service. People honor you. You can't honor yourself. What's your True. manifesto, sir? I've just mentioned one of it, providing free Medicare, uh -huh. right? Ensuring security is proper. In what way? Maybe you can give us some specific security. Security is simple. Why do you respect a police officer? Because he has a brutal force, number one. Number two, you respect him because he has the ability to arrest you. Now, when you're dealing with a dangerous situation like Al-Shabaab, and you've not armed our police officers, you've not taken care of them, for sure, that war will go on for a very long time. Secondly, I talked about a reward system. If you expect any employee to perform, the reward system must be correct. You need to give these people housing, you need to give them medical care, you need to pay them correctly, and they must feel their competence and ability is being rewarded Properly. And right now, that is not the case? It's not the case. So they're not being paid well, in your view? Housing is not proper? Of course. Numbers? The numbers, there is a UN, uh, I think it's one police officer, 200 people, around that number. You are yet to know exactly. I do not know the exact number of police officers we have in Kenya, because that is the ratio that must be maintained. And you must give them superior training, and remember, security is so not just know, brutal force. So you don't know how many police officers are in the country? My friend, we are the employing, numbers are out in the public we're, domain, we're, sir. We are employing every day. There are police officers being trained. There are police officers dying. These statistics you get on a daily basis and adjust and annually revamp and annually retrench. But some would say, for you to be able to create policy that says we are short of these numbers, we want to meet that UN ratio that you speak of by this, that you would at least have an idea that these are the numbers that we are dealing with. I don't with. know. The last time we did this arithmetic, a police officer was in charge of about 700 people, mm -hmm. when he's supposed to be in charge of 400 people. 
So I'm just talking, we must make sure that we maintain the right ratios, you give them the right training. And I want to tell you, security mainly is information. When you have information, you are capable of averting the disasters we have always seen. And I'm saying, you need a proper reward system. You this, need yeah. to change. I, I, I'd like to stick on, on, on the issue of the ratios that you're saying, that we need to improve that and empower the police officers. And you mentioned something interesting about, you know, a policeman has to be able to have the brute force to do that. But, sir, the new constitution changed that. We're now a police service rather than a police force. And there's been an effort to change the approach and the relationship between uh, police officers and the citizenry. Are you then saying we We're should walk talking. back and make no. police brutal? Yvonne, that, that, those are your words, sir. Please, security in its proper form. When you find America is respected by a certain country, it's because they have one superior training, superior weaponry, and they'll be able to subdue you. We have a situation where our police officers are being killed by thugs on a daily basis, right? And they can hardly protect themselves. We have thugs who have much more superior weapons than our police officers. That's what I meant. And surely, if you are sending, this is somebody's a child also, you're sending him to make sure that the rest of you can sleep as he sleeps in the cold, ensuring that you are safe. For God's sake, provide him with the right equipment for him to be able to take on whoever has decided to do whatever is wrong. So we can't allow criminals having much more superior weapons than our police officers. So we just arm them so that they're equally matched? It's just a question, sir. <laughs> we are not in a battle between criminals and police officers. I simply said you need to give them superior equipment for them to be able to maintain law and order, and particularly when they're dealing with dangerous criminals. Okay, I want us to talk about another big issue um, at the moment, um, something that is constitutional but that has plagued um, this 11th parliament, and that is the question of the two-thirds gender rule. What's been your, your thoughts or your assessment on why this has remained elusive? I think it's about selfishness. And uh, given that the men are majority in parliament, and they know very well that uh, this constitution was passed by all Kenyans. Uh, and they are the lawmakers. They should begin by respecting the constitution that was passed. And therefore, all of them agree that we need to affirmatively act by making sure that we pass that particular legislation. So that is my stand on that. You do not pa pass a constitution, then subvert it by refusing to pass the legislation that gives it the right meat for it to be functional. There have been questions about whether the country can afford it. What do you think? Kenya is a rich country, extremely rich. And anybody talking uh, about lack of uh, uh, ability to, to manage uh, the cost is, is actually lying. Kenya has no idea of even what it has underground. What we have uh, rushed it to is squeeze Mananji with heavy taxes. We don't want to encourage investment by looking at what this country is able and incapable of producing so that we expand the tax base, so that we make Kenyans live a better life. By the way, the minerals in this republic, with the rough idea of what I have, is the only way Kenya is going to come out of the debt that has been incurred over the last four years. It is by encouraging investors to deal with our minerals, so that we get our 30% taxation, we get our royalties, which puts its baby at around 36 or 30 so, to help us deal with the debt situation in this country. This country is extremely rich. You look at the fisheries in this country, it is totally untapped. Look at our oceans. It is the Chinese who are coming and stealing our fish from morning up to evening. So we are not short of well, uh, uh, resources. It is clearly lack of focusing and understanding mm -hmm. what do we need to give priority. Let me ask in terms of priority, and now that's something you've mentioned, the food issue in the country? Supply and demand. You need a clear supply chain. You need to know when a, value chain, a supply chain turns into a value chain. You need to give farmers a voice. 
you need to restructure what we used to call KFA so that the farmers are able to say, this is the pain I go through. You cannot justify to me how a farmer suffers for several years to get a calf, milk is milk, you give him 40 shillings, and the same one liter uh, milk you are selling at 130 just for packaging and a bit of processing. So you need a clear supply chain, and you must understand when it turns into a value chain. What supplier, and how do farmers get the right fertilizer? Mm -hmm. Do we have extension officers to know what is right for the farmer? If we have KFA, have we given farmers a voice to say what they feel they should rightly be paid? Mm -hmm. A farmer being paid less than 2,000 shillings for a bag of maize, and then the same bag of maize tomorrow is being sold for 10,000, doesn't make sense at all. There is something definitely wrong. And therefore, it is an issue of management. Mm -hmm. It is not an, an issue of shortage. We have serious board. We have storage facilities in this country. Mm -hmm. There is nothing we lack in this country. It is just that those that are in charge are totally not interested in ensuring the Kenyan, both consumer mm -hmm. and producer, get a fair deal. Okay. We've come to the close of our discussion. I'd just like to read out um, some feedback to you from our viewers this evening, and then we'll have you uh, do your closing remarks. William also says, please ask Jirongo if he has a bone to pick with Ruto. As Ruto once claimed he was jealous of him, you will remember uh, this statement. Um, King Nyanga says, huyu anavainini kantrigani. Okay, um, that, that's an interesting one. Um, Again, the question about whether you're dividing the Luya vote seems to come up quite a bit. That's from Dan Kanshiundu. Um, Josef Mbaka says, can you tell us the main reason why he's going for the higher seat rather than his former um, parliamentary seat or a gubernatorial one? Um, King Chris, that's at I am Chris, says, president of which country? Um, Kasunye Kaluvengo says, Jirongo came from the moon. He's contesting after the election. He will go back to the moon, never to be seen again till the next election. Um, yeah, so there's, there's quite a number of those. So in closing, what is that one thing you're going to say uh, to Kenyans? Maybe many of them say, we didn't see you and haven't heard much from you and you haven't walked the journey with Kenyans as um, you know, the various struggles have gone through. You mentioned them at the beginning, the terror attacks, uh, the economy, food security, uh, water and, and water scarcity in the country. And some say, we didn't hear your voice over the last four and a half years and you come up now and say, I want to be president. Um, you're talking about self-actualization of honor, but tell Kenyans why they should believe in you when a number of them say you want to be relevant, we don't know who you are, we don't really understand you and your plans for the country. Uh, I have time for Kenyans to understand my plans for the country. That is number one. Secondly, choosing a leader is the greatest thing any individual needs to do. And I think Kenyans need to start thinking very hard before they make decisions. And uh, sometimes we get carried by euphoria without looking at content. And at the end of the day, we end up from a frying pan to the fire itself. I want to urge Kenyans to give every single candidate an opportunity, listen to what his thoughts are. And somebody who believes in what he's saying Kenyans are intelligent enough, you can see it from his face. People who don't believe in what they are saying, who are there to spin stories, you can tell it from his face. I do believe Kenyans will look at all of us with clear eye, without prejudices, and look at what are we able to offer for this republic. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Cyrus Shakalaka. <laughs> he is a presidential candidate for the 2017 August 8th presidential election. He says, you can tell from his face. Can you? Will you be voting for him on the 8th of August, which is just a little under 50 days away? Well, you will be the judge of that. We thank you very much for making the time to be with us today. You've been watching Meet the President with me, Yvonne Okwara. Thanks very much for watching. We will see you again with yet another presidential candidate. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.